So the green light is going round and round. So I'm not quite sure that. Here we go. And we are live, I think. Um, so welcome uh, to our session today, leading the future of finance post-COVID. Um, and what a moment, really, to talk about finance, to talk about the world, and to talk about the economy. Uh, here today with me um, are four distinguished speakers. Uh, we have, um, from the top of the screen, uh, Jim McCohen, um, a very veteran um, asset management executive with a variety of roles over 30 years, uh, most recently with principal. Um, to his right, uh, Robert Schaff, Chief Executive Officer of the Luxembourg Stock Exchange, uh, leading exchange for green products, especially green bonds, which have been the pandemic product of choice. Um, on the lower set of the screen, right under, is um, the other Robert, Robert Khan, who's Managing Director of Automated Financial Systems uh, USA. And then finally, to his right, is Alejandro uh, Valenzuela, Chief Executive Officer of Banco Azteca, Mexico, one of Mexico's largest banks, um, and with perhaps, we hope, a view, a very profound view on what's happening in the real economy. I'm Nandini Sukumar from the World Federation of Exchanges. Uh, we are the industry body for exchanges and CCPs, the market infrastructures that have kept you safe through this crisis. So let me kick off, really. Um, the purpose of our session today is to talk about COVID, the economy, and how the two come together. And really what I, where I wanted to start um, with all of you was to say the COVID-19 pandemic is a health crisis. It's a health crisis that has triggered both a financial crisis and a societal crisis because what, gra what we grapple with now are issues such as economic inequality, gender, and race. So arguably it's an existential moment for all of us. So what is the role of finance? What is the role of markets? What is the role of the financial system in this crisis? And the next one, and the next one is one that we have just started. So let me start, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go first to Jim because he's nodding. Um, Jim, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Nandini. Um, I think firstly, and uh, Robert will have comments on this also, I'm sure, but the role of markets I tend to think of in uh, a crisis or in a time of turmoil is as a shock absorber. It provides, markets provide liquidity and capital, which uh, is sorely needed at a time of economic slowdown, which is what the, cri the economic crisis associated with coronavirus has essentially been. It's been a rapid, uh, in some ways, unprecedented economic slowdown. And uh, I think that shock absorber function has been very well discharged up to now. The problem I see arising is if the crisis turns into a credit crisis, which is probably the next phase, then uh, what will happen uh, in terms of the market reaction? The 2008-09 crisis was not a good precedent. That was fundamentally a credit crisis, and markets didn't behave in as stable a way as they have this year with what is in some ways a more severe crisis. So I think that's interesting. I think the markets have done very well so far in terms of providing a good uh, cushion for the economy. But I, I think looking forward, there is a danger with so much pro-cyclical trading, um, things like variable annuity hedging or risk parity trading going on in the US market, that you may get a bout of volatility. Uh, on your other point, Nandini, I think this is really important for our long-term future in terms of inequality and diversity. I hope, and the signs are pretty good so far, that the financial system will see the crisis as an opportunity to accelerate their efforts in diversity, because I think that is a really important opportunity, as well as one that could fundamentally be a shock absorber, a safety uh, move for society. So I'm hopeful on that. And I think the financial sector has had a pretty good crisis so far and uh, can do a lot for the economy uh, as things develop. Robert, you know, your exchange is the leader in green bonds and green products. Do you agree, with Jim? Well, you know, I think it's worthwhile highlighting that um, the magnitude of this crisis, uh, uh, a sanitary crisis to kick off, where we had very little knowledge about what was happening 
followed by a lockdown with unprecedented impacts on economies where we have still no idea where we are really heading. And you know, in fact, these are typically the type of uncertainty environment which could um, uh, which test financial markets. And you know, uh, and we have seen, in fact, what happened mid uh, mid March and, uh, and and the days and weeks that followed. You know, in fact, the good news is that financial markets stood strong. And I mean, I'm, I'm talking about it from an operational point of view. And you know, in fact whether it's market infrastructure like the changes or other platforms, they all have been moving and fulfilling their role, whether it's in developing countries or in developed markets uh, overall. And also let's remind that we were talking about lockdown period already at that point in time. And we, for example, absorbed that shock as an exchange uh, while we were working 98% remotely. And we managed to put the exchange within 72 hours entirely remote with increased um, uh, risk control functions because, in fact, suddenly we were not no longer watching each other on the same screen, uh, but uh, individually. And all of this has been working very well. So that, uh, I think, uh, should be highlighted. And we can talk about why, why did it uh, work out. And I think... Uh, it's a combination of uh, having learned the lessons also from 2008 to a certain extent and also, in fact, the technology development, but we can maybe talk about this later on. And what's interesting, in fact, for uh, um, uh, to, to, to share with you, in fact, uh, you were referring to the Green Exchange and uh, our leading role, where, in fact, we are an exchange that's above all a listing exchange and not uh, not so much a trading exchange. So, in fact, we are listing, just to give you an idea, 36,000 bonds from all over the world uh, in uh, all currencies you can think of. And we have created in 2016 the Luxembourg Green Exchange, which is an, a dedicated platform for green, social and sustainability financial instruments. And what we have seen in Q2, and it followed through even in Q3, despite the fact that Q3 is typically the summer uh, slowdown period, we have seen massive amounts of activity in the market. And uh, ju just to give you a, an, a two numbers, during these six months, in fact, there were roughly 160 billion US dollars of green social and sustainability bonds being launched. And we uh, were lucky and happy to uh, basically collect more than 100 billion on that platform. So in fact, yes, we are the leading exchange in, in that respect. But in fact, what is more important is that this market, this debt market, was working extremely well. And we might be just at the beginning of a developing of that market because, you know, all the billions that need to be collected from institutions, from governments, from co uh, co uh, companies, well, you need to, they, come, they need to come from somewhere. And uh, we see, in fact, this trend to move uh, into the sustainability arena much more quickly. So uh, if I can already now say one conclusion of COVID-19 from our perspective is certainly that the awareness that sustainability, that means basically a change of behavior from everybody, from consumers to investors, has been accelerated. That's for sure. Yeah. Alejandro, I want to ask you, I mean, would you and Robert, uh, sorry, Robert, you, are, okay. you and Robert are both uh, representative, the connection with the real economy. Um, when we talk, just to take, pick up on Robert's point on sustainability and put it into context, you know, with the, with the opening question, which is, you know, we have to address the, the fi financial system, finance in general, has to make that connection now um, with, you know, with people um, and with life. Um, that is in a non-financial world in essence. Would you agree that there will be a take-up in sustainable products? What, in your eyes, for both of you, both Robert and Alejandro, would you feel is, is the role of finance? Go ahead, Robert. <laughs> I'm going to let you take it. Um, so so the, the view of, um, of financial institutions for ESG goals and sustainable finance was already uh, top of mind at uh, a year ago at the IMF World Bank meetings. And every major bank uh, was discussing how they would be supportive 
of that. And I, I think that remains true and, and real. Uh, what, what does COVID do to that? Well, we can have a pretty lengthy discussion about the changing model of banking uh, that is emerging with low interest rates and, and other challenges, uh, which, which colors uh, what executives like Alejandro have to th- be thinking about to uh, position their firms uh, f- for the future. But if you look at um, the partnership, public-private partnership, uh, much of the stimulus in Europe, and if it's a Biden administration, and even if it's not in, in the U.S., will we'll have a sustainability uh, focus to it. And, and the exchanges and the banks are, are, are very much li- will line up uh, around that uh, because it's, uh, one, the right thing to do, and two, very good business. Um, and, and, you know, the banks are thinking about their social responsibility uh, if we migrate to the social unrest piece, uh, you see banks looking at uh, their diversity internally and with their customer base and how they address that. So uh, financial institutions want to be good actors in this. Uh, they also want to be profitable. And uh, Jim referenced the, the looming credit crunch if we get a second wave. So there are uh, factors to be considered as to the strength uh, the long-term strength of the banks and where they need to go. But in principle, they align very nicely with uh, the, the ESG goals that we may talk further about. Alejandro? Well, first of all, uh, I couldn't agree more with what uh, yourself, Robert, Robert and Jim have said. Clearly, in, a, in addition to what has been stated, I think that going to the basic question that was posted, uh, I, I see the financial sector as a circulatory, circulatory system of a body. And uh, clearly, uh, it's a shock absorber, but at the end of the day, it facilitates the movement between savings and investment, the payment system. And uh, what worries me today, uh, in essence, of what we're seeing through, because obviously we're going to be talking about all the evolution that uh, it's going through the system, it's the trustworthiness and the transparency of the system. We've been seeing uh, lately, uh, going back to the greedy uh, behaviors of uh, certain institutions, uh, obviously, uh, Things that uh, do hurt, and it's fundamental for the system in terms of uh, shock absorbing, in terms of sustainability, in terms of uh, uh, allowing the whole thing to work, that uh, these premises are, are always there. And uh, obviously, uh, it needs to be regulated. I mean, it, it's hard for some, from someone that comes from the private sector to say, to say, well, we need to be regulated. Well, at the end of the day, the moral hazard and the problems that we generate when uh, the system doesn't work correctly uh, it's huge, and uh, definitely uh, part of the good functioning of this system, COVID or not COVID, it's making sure that we are trustworthy and transparent as much as we can. Hey, Robert, can I jump? Uh, sorry, guys, can I jump on that? Yes, like please well, each other as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah um, I mean, the, the role of regulators is essential in, in what we do. Uh, the, the challenge is, uh, that we see from the regulators are their uh, areas of expertise and their level of understanding. And we, we see that in the last, uh, you know, <laughs> financial shock. Uh, they, they are just getting their arms around uh, fintech and, and digital and, and what that means. Um, so that if we expand to the other ESG goals and some of these broader topics, I don't think the regulatory community despite wanting to add some of these factors to stress testing, are, are geared to uh, support that. And that's no disrespect to our regulators. They're very important. I, I, I meet with them uh, on a constant basis. But, um, boy, <clears throat> they don't have the bandwidth of staff uh, to broaden themselves to deal with these issues, nor do they have um, the um, ability to pay up. Uh, for staff to do this the way that the financial institutions do. So there's always a bit of a discrepancy. Go ahead. Now, let, let me chip in, and uh, obviously uh, for the rest to come in. What I meant here is that we need to make sure that we work together and in tandem with them because clearly they're behind the curve, as you stated. But the problem is the moral hazard we generate with any yes. bad decision or with any over-leveraging or with any issue that can affect society as a whole. 
And if we don't work with them all the time and make them understand what's going on, particularly with all the technological breakthroughs we're seeing through in the industry with the acceleration of COVID that we're doing in five, five years, in five months, uh, this work has to be done together. Uh, otherwise, their regulation could hinder the good evolution of the financial sector over time. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely on that uh, need to partner. Appropriate to regulation is really vital to the functioning of markets. Um, you, you know, mar free markets are the best way to allocate capital and resources in the economy, but they only work if they're fair and trusted, and uh, that's where the regulators come in. So I, I would join with Robert and Alejandro in supporting thoughtful regulation. So I would say to Robert Sharp, you know, uh, surely the role of the exchange is also, you know, to support that regulated market. Yeah. Robert. Well, you know, in fact, I uh, also to add to, to this debate here, uh, I, I have the impression when I'm looking at Europe, uh, for example, the, the regulator, in fact, is coming in not with more rules on how markets should function, but in fact, more how companies and, uh, and their managers uh, should behave. And, uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, or if you're obliging banks, asset managers, to report on how they behave versus their, I call it now, uh, societal responsibility, uh, well, you know, that's how you, you start triggering a, a change of behavior. And I think, in fact, reckless behavior in finance has no future. I'm not saying, in fact, that doesn't exist today and everything is on the right web, but I think, in fact, the fundamental route that regulators, uh, and, and Europe is very strong on that side, uh, uh, to, uh, to responsibilize, in fact, managers much more in the banking sector, in the financial sector globally, but also in the rest of the economy, in the industrial sectors. Right? And that's what triggers a change of behavior and that also then leads towards how finance operates differently uh, moving forward. And when I'm uh, uh, linking this to exchanges, well, obviously, uh, uh, most of exchanges in the meantime have put uh, uh, online uh, and recommended to their issuers um, a code of conduct uh, of good behavior. And it's not only what I call then the old governance, but also the new governance with respect to uh, how do you behave towards, uh, with respect to climate change, to respect to uh, social matters, uh, and uh, all of these elements have gained traction in Europe very much over the last six months, and that's what I explained earlier on, has been also reflected in uh, the, the volume of issues. Uh, and let's be clear, when you're issuing a bond, of uh, social or uh, sustainability or green nature, it's more cumbersome. It means more cost. It means more reporting uh, now and later on, in fact, during the life of the instrument. And if these volumes are exploding for the time being, and I just referred to, let's remember, in fact, Germany just did 6.5 billion of uh, their twin green bonds. Luxembourg, the Luxembourg government even, it's a small country, but uh, issued 1.5 billion of sustainability bonds. And it's not the question of who issues how much, but in fact, what is for sure, that every dollar that's being levied in the market that way, under these financing schemes, are being invested in sustainable infrastructure, in sustainable pro uh, projects going forward. And that helps the overall economy and also it changes the behavior or, or let's say, in fact, the structure of the loan portfolios of banking, for sure, because, in fact, there are also green principles or sustainable principles that you need to apply these days because we all know that um, uh, of the businesses or business models are at risk if, in fact, sustainability is not uh, gaining more importance in the evaluation of risks. Robert, you bring up code of conduct, and I'd like to throw a question to you and Alessandro and Jim, please feel free to answer as well, that I wanted to ask a, a group of uh, chief risk officers of major banks last week, and they didn't want to deal with it. Uh, but as I think of, uh, you know, personal conduct and, and, and managing employees in a remote workplace where we have all our staff working from home, I asked them, well, what, what, what has your HR department done? to 
assure that uh, conduct remains what it was when it was in the office. Um, and, and, you know, we're going to see more and more of this. So uh, you run a bank, you run an exchange, and you've run many things, Jim. Uh, what, um, what are you doing here? Do you want to, do you want to comment on that? Can, can I comment on the, the bank and the interbank market situation? Because, Robert, you're referring to bank chief risk officers. One of the things that they ought to be really quite scared about is the lack of transparency of interbank markets. We've just this week had a big fine on a major bank for mistrading in the government bond and commodity markets. We had the LIBOR scandal. We had FX, so the custody banks, paid big fines and restitution to clients for bad execution in currencies. Why is this happening? Well, exchanges have a price tape. Exchanges have a record of what activity was. And if you're on a stock exchange, you can know with real certainty whether your execution was good or not. In a, even a large and liquid interbank market, that's not true. There is no good record. If I gave you an order to sell $3 billion of a U.S. government bond right now, 5 o'clock this afternoon, New York time, I wouldn't know whether I was ripped off or whether the execution was good. Whereas if I did it on the Luxembourg Stock Exchange, I would, because you have a price track. I do think something is going to have to happen with interbank markets to reduce that risk. And I think the banks, in terms of sustainability of their business, will be in a much better position, even if many of them lose a very lucrative source of profits from informational asymmetries. So that's my perhaps slightly controversial view on what you were discussing. But you know, in fact, you are throwing a ball in the direction of the exchanges. In fact, yep. that's exactly yeah, what we I'm have been on the right side of this. Yeah, <laughs> no, but we have been defending towards regulators, and notably in the EU. In fact, there have been many directives in the sense of uh, uh, liberalizing markets, and uh, we have uh, next to the exchange markets, of course, many platforms of all kind, the MTFs. But you know, in fact, the exchanges are probably the most heavily regulated institutions in the financial markets overall. And uh, bringing more business to the exchanges would definitely, in fact, mean uh, having more control and more supervision about what's going on. Now, uh, uh, can you bring the FX market on the exchange? But, you know, in fact, there are, there are different ways of, uh, and there are different papers that have been written in the past uh, about this. Uh, there are certainly room to do more. And as I said, in fact, uh, exchanges are extremely heavily regulated, and that means whatever happens on our platform is being reported, is transparent, and also is uh, also controlled by the supervisors uh, at the end of the day. That's a really interesting point, and that would, that would solve part of the problem, or could solve part of the problem. Of course, the other side of the problem is exchanges tend to be expensive places to trade. The interbank market lives on the fact that it can pretend at least to be very cheap uh, to trade in. I suspect a combination of more business to exchanges and banks using better technology to show transparency is probably where it'll go. Uh, you know, with respect to price competitiveness, I, I, I'm afraid you are referring to a, a, a long past, in fact, uh, which is uh, <laughs> long gone. Uh, today we are also uh, uh, trading and also uh, the fees are razor thin, in fact, today. <laughs> Um, and in fact, it's a great point because one of the one of the things I wanted to ask all of you was, and you've teed me up nicely for it, Jim, because if all of you believe that you know the exchange market or the regulated lit market um, is where kind of you have pro you have market integrity and price transparency, why is there this disconnect between private markets and public markets? Why is so much being done on private markets? Um, and public markets, while growing, still have so far to go compared to the OTC markets, in part. And in OTC, it's not just OTC. I'm, I'm including in that private market. I'm including all the private sources of funding uh, that all of you are well familiar with. Um, maybe I should ask Alejandro as, as the bank, as the commercial, and, and also, you know, somebody who will have a quite a nuanced perspective on consumer and consumer credit you know, issues around the choices people make? Well, uh, first of all, and uh, 
in a sense, going back to the to the previous comments, uh, we'll be uh, always talking about transparency and and trustworthiness in terms of uh, market functioning. Now, uh, moving on. Uh, uh, the question that uh, actually Robert asked, uh, just to, to, to make sure I answer too, uh, dealing with uh, people and uh, dealing with the digital world will require more policy. And just people don't want to accept it. But uh, at the end of the day, if you don't monitor permanently whatever we're doing, uh, both personally and both through the systems and institutions, and uh, the clarity behind all these transactions are not there, Clearly, we will not be able to move forward. I think that every time I think uh, the way actually we're dealing today through the digi digital world, if George Orwell would be alive, he would actually rewrite 1984 uh, in terms of what's happening today. And he will be, uh, in essence, seeing a big brother watching us uh, in a very different manner. Firms will require to make sure that they uh, follow through uh, in every aspect of uh, the way its employees and its people work across the board and the interactions they have because otherwise we'll, we are going to be losing the capacity to uh, to do things correctly. And again, greed and arbitrage and all these old uh, previous things that Kindleberger in its uh, classic book of crisis manics and panics uh, did some years ago, uh, you, you know we're going to be doing the same thing over and over because human nature is there. So uh, we just need the, actually the new... IT platforms to make sure that we behave correctly and that, and as it was mentioned before, that the sanctions are there, you know, very few bankers and very few people in the financial world truly go to jail. And we need to make sure that uh, if we behave incorrectly, we just to pay the consequences. Yeah, the, the, an interesting point on private markets, and you raise a really important market structure question, Nandini. One of the things that interests me is people will always blame regulation if there's a move, for example, the move away from public markets that we've seen in smaller and mid-sized companies. So blaming regulation is easy, but a lot of it often has to do with tax. And, uh, you know, I think one of the attractions of private markets is if I'm running a mutual fund for people's retirement savings, my profits get taxed as ordinary income. If I'm running a hedge fund for the wealthy, they get taxed as capital gains under the carried interest exemption. So in the U.S. currently, I pay probably less than half the tax I would if it was ordinary income. So that's an important lack of level playing field. Uh, another issue uh, would be that private markets have lived a lot of the last few years on dividend recapture by pushing up leverage. And that's the most deductible leverage that's been tax favored to run very high leverage levels in private companies. I don't think that's sustainable. I don't think that's sensible because when you get to a crisis, those leverage companies are very vulnerable, as we've seen with half the retail industry in the U.S. going bankrupt. Well, and then, it get, then it gets to the question of which is our base currency, trust. You know, that, that, that is what financial institutions run on. And there are many ways to lose that, erode that trust, and it comes with consequence, whether it's some of these tax and regulatory issues that Jim talked about, whether it's rogue employees, whether it's misuse of technology. And, and that's one of the dangers of the fintechs, uh, because they don't have the same relationship uh, with trust and with regulations and uh, some of the cultural DNA of, of banks and and you know, older financial institutions. Uh, and their missteps can erode confidence and trust in all of us. Uh, yeah. I'll leave it at that and let others comment. On your, on your question, Robert, about, um, about uh, for the risk officers, if I were still running a large investment manager right now, I'd be trying everything I could to get some of the traders and compliance people back into the office. Because I think that's the part of the business where you're most vulnerable to people going off on their own. Yeah, I, I concur. So maybe adding one one element uh, which is close to my heart, I must say. In fact, we uh, very often when we're looking at financial markets, we are talking institutions, and we are forgetting uh, completely, in fact, retail investors. And you know, in fact, this split between private and public markets. Typically, if I simplify it, uh, goes to the expense and at the cost 
of the retail investor. Because at the end of the day, and we see this in equity and other, uh, and other uh, um, financial instruments too, uh, all of these private markets or, or these platforms work on the basis of price formation that comes from the exchanges. But the difference is that uh, versus the previous situation that this price formation is done on a fraction of the volume only. Because, in fact, you do not see what's happening in the, in the private sector. And therefore, in, typically, in fact, uh, uh, it's easy to take the prices from the exchanges, which are being fixed on lower volumes, and you transpose them more efficiently into the, the private sector. And they say, in fact, basically, exchanges are too expensive. But they are too expensive because the price formation is not optimal, as, in fact, a lot of the volume ex- escapes, in fact, its scope. And, you know, that means ultimately where do private individuals or private investors execute their orders? Well, typically they go to the broker or goes to the exchange and they pay the price at the end of the day. Well, and, and, and just uh, to follow up on what you're saying, just uh, think of what it, we just found out uh, this past days, you know, of spoofing, uh, that actually you tend to signal the market in a way that it's cheating to make sure that you send signals, which obviously you will not abide by, and then you take positions, either long or short, that uh, will take advantage over the market. And I think that's also lack of morality and lack of ethics. Yep. So, you know, at this point, 15 minutes left for the session. Um, I wanted to ask you all about, you know, three key trends that you see. And I think we've all agreed that trust is one of them. So let's keep let's hit, take that down to two. We'll do we'll do a, a whip round. Um, I'll go with you first, Jim. Um, two key trends for the next eighteen months. Thank you, Nandini. Uh, I would point to two key trends being firstly digital acceleration. You start from the fact that nobody wants to send big books around; they want the digital form of it. Partly because they can analyze it, but partly also working from home and partly with the risk of contagion. And I've seen in the asset management industry, 2020 is going to see about five years worth of progress towards digitization. And I think that will continue because I don't think we're going back to uh, a big reduction in the use of technology. I think this is a, a step change that has been made in economies. So all kinds of processes will be digitized and that will satisfy the need for greater transparency because technology is a great way to do that. Um, It will also lead to uh, economy of uh, execution and the ability to to manage things more immediately with things like same-day settlement coming in. I think people just don't understand anymore why they have to wait a week for their money when they sell a stock uh, in many cases. So digital acceleration. My other comment is a new one to this discussion. We didn't get on it in the first half hour, but it's continued low interest rates. I think if you look at it in a kind of monetarist technical way, what I'm really saying here is we're already, with aging demographics in the wealthy world, we're already seeing a lower velocity of money. I think the coronavirus makes that even more extreme. And I think you're going to have low velocity of money leading to very little inflationary pressure in spite of the increases in the monetary base. So I don't know whether the natural 10-year yield in the U.S. is zero, half a percent, or one percent, but it sure as anything isn't four or five percent, which is what people used to think. And I I think that very low interest rates will have both uh, challenges and opportunities. Thank you. Robert Sharp, you next. Well, um... Transparency, trust, uh, technology, uh, I, I fully subscribe to that. Um, I won't surprise you if I say, in fact, sustainability and sustainable finance will uh, get accelerated. And it's not only, uh, and I think that's the, the, the major kick, in fact, which COVID provided. We are, when we are talking sustainable finance, we are no longer talking about niches. It becomes mainstream in the sense that companies, uh, whatever project you are financing, but companies, if they want to access capital markets in the future, need to show the the investor their ESG profile. In other words, who are they? How do they behave? What values do they pursue? And so on. And if that's not happening, they will have problems of accessing capital 
uh, as they, uh, um, and it will be more difficult or at least much more expensive than in the past. Linked to that, in fact, uh, we are talking here about the economy, and that means uh, uh, manufacturing companies also, they have on the other side the consumer. And the consumer, in fact, is starting to ask the same questions about how is it being done, uh, how is my product manufactured, and uh, basically can I buy it with uh, having a good conscience or, or not. So this is changing fundamentally. And um, um, the, the, the other point I would like to mention, um, I think, in fact, there is an understanding in the market, and it starts with governments in the first place, uh, that there are things that need to change post-COVID. Uh, uh, and um, it expresses very nicely in three words, which says, in fact, build back better. And what does build back better mean? In fact, it means, of course, convergence, that means fixing what uh, uh, or repairing what the impacts of COVID have been in the first place. But it also means resilience, and that means we need to reform our economies. And I think this understanding is, is, is coming up much more clearly, and there will be a third element, and we started the discussion by looking at the society. In fact, it's about transformation, and that means remodeling our societies. So we need more balance, we need more convergence, we need we need to have basically better economies going forward. And, you know, when I'm looking at these enormous funding programs that are being, um, uh, 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 which are, uh, have been announced or planned and being deployed to the markets, and I refer again to uh, Europe, uh, we have 100 billion of euros under the SURE program, which is about to be released uh, in the next couple of weeks. There are 750 billion to follow. Uh, 35% of, of, of all this funding should go into sustainable projects. So in other words, it's not about rebuilding what we had before, but rebuilding something which is more future oriented, which will help, which will become more resilient uh, from an infrastructure point of view. And in other words, in fact, doing something good for the future generations for sure. Robert Kahn. Yeah, Can so... Thank you. My, my themes were largely uh, taken by uh, the colleagues who spoke uh, first, but if I could wrap it up in, in if I could put it in one wrapper, um, it, it, there's an opportunity and a threat, and, and it's to the existing business model of financial institutions. Uh, the um, low interest rates are, are going to hit profitability. Um, if we get a second wave, and even if we don't, the credit uh cliff is going to hit financial institutions. There's lots of challenges on the horizon. Uh, technology creates uh, huge advantages, but it needs to be managed well. And, and it, 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 um, it challenges the existing business model. So there's an opportunity to build back better. There's a necessity to reevaluate the business model of financial institutions in light of current and, and, and uh, you know, very near-term future conditions as to how are we going to make money? How are we going to serve our clients and our customers and our shareholders and other stakeholders? What, 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 how do we manage this most effectively? And since we're turning to a CEO for next one, <laughs> maybe I teed up a, a question, <laughs> a tough question for Alejandro. <laughs> and and oh, yeah. you have the last word on that. I can see that. Uh, well, uh, l let me uh, see it in two parts. The question relates to the next 18 months. So, so the first thing we have to deal is with the mess, uh, crossing the desert. We just don't know today the length and the extent of the COVID-19 uh, crisis, what kind of recovery we're going to see. A lot of people ta are talking about uh, this K, where you have a, a, a very thin upper part of the uh, leg of the K and a thicker part uh, on the lower part which means that we're going to see uh, very few firms being very successful. Obviously, everything that has to do with the digital world, everything that has to do with uh, e-commerce, uh, e everything that, that, that has to do with this new way of uh, undertaking uh, economic relations is booming. But on the counterpart, uh, if you think of uh, the hospitality industries, uh, airlines, hotels, uh, 
all, all the ones you can think about it, even the shared economy, which was uh, booming before the COVID-19, they're in a shock. So how are we going to be dealing with this uh, crisis and the consequences of unorthodox monetary and fiscal policies? Uh, what are they going to imply? Who's going to pay for this? I mean, uh, Jim was talking about the problem of, uh, well, everyone was talking about the problems of low interest rates and uh, disinflation. The, the, the issue is that uh, how is this going to be paid over time? Higher taxes, inflationary taxes, what kind of economic policies we're going to be requiring for that? And at the same time that we deal with this thing, the financial world, it's being transformed in a manner which uh, we have never seen. Uh, it's going very fast. It's moving at a speed that just coping with it uh, entails uh, for a business running on the one side and transforming and dealing with disruption. And these elements uh, make it extremely challenging because you're having several fronts to deal with. And probably uh, the, the first focus, as it was mentioned uh, before by Robert, it's surviving. Yeah, in, in this kind of world where you're seeing that the margins are being compressed, that there might be a credit crunch, that maybe the consumer who uh, was not leveraged today under the new circumstances, he's over leveraged and it, he requires or she requires that restructuring or maybe uh, they will not be able to pay you back and your capacity to generate uh, reserves uh, might not be enough to deal with what's going on. And I think uh, it puts just a lot of pressure uh, on the decision making and on the risk assessment. And also, I truly believe, I mean, uh, probably we need to build new models. Uh, in understanding what's going on, because the legacies we have might only just hurt that we're capacity to take good decisions. Thank you. We've got three minutes left, so I'm going to do a final round, and I want um, one idea from each of you um, to take away uh, for us from the audience and from all of us as panelists together, and that is what is, what is the solution? And ideally, we'd have a whole discussion around it, but I'd like one idea from you each of you, but we leave aside the vaccine, how can the financial system be the greatest part of the solution um, once we are through in the post-pandemic world, whenever it is? And I'll start with Jim, only because I have started from the beginning with Jim. Your turn. Thank you, Nandini. Um, it's as much a question as a, as a solution, as an idea. And I think what we're seeing, and it's early to tell, but some countries and some businesses are handling this really quite effectively and others are not. I look at uh, East Asia, even Western Europe, managed it very effectively with very good governance. The Americas, a lot more trouble. Russia, South Asia, Africa, a lot more potential trouble. Will this make a difference to investors? It's been a great play to focus on the U.S. as an investor for the last decade or more. Is it still going to be so coming out of this? I think a lot depends on how well this, this whole uh, pandemic gets managed looking forward. And the signs are, are not good for the U.S. I hope that we can recover. Um, but uh, I think that's really my question for investors. Thank you. Robert Chaff. Well, to be very brief, in fact, I uh, would start by uh, quoting, in fact, the vice uh, president of the European Parliament who said, in fact, a couple of years ago, in the meantime, the one sentence, uh, without money, you can dream, and with money, you can act. And act, action is what we, what we need. And, you know, in fact, for me, the... Uh, the development uh, or why finance uh, is part of the solution is expressed in two words and it's called transition finance. And you know, transition finance builds the bridge between sustainability, that means the, the more pure uh, 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 world, and the conventional finance. And transition finance is for me a game changer going forward and I recommend you watch out for this. Uh, we will be talking much more about uh, transition finance in the in the months and years to come. Thank you, Robert Kahn. Yeah, I'll be real quick because we don't have much time. Public-private partnership. This is not something the banks can solve. The financial institutions can solve on their own. Nor can the government solve on their own. We all have to have a plan and work the plan together. Finance has a big role in that. Thank you. Thank you, and Alejandro, last well, word. Go back to the beginning. 
go work with more co cooperation between parties and more transparency to truly make sure that we move forward a financial system that needs to move in the right direction so that we can uh, assure that savings and investment and the payment system works correctly and evolves with the new reality of the world. Thank you all. You've been wonderful panelists. Uh, we leave with a sense of optimism and I look forward to reuniting you all to discuss the solutions in greater depth. Thank you very much. The future of finance. Thanks, everyone. Really Thank pleasure to be with you. Same. Thanks. Bye, Jim. Bye. Bye, Robert. Hey, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure. Bye bye. Thank you all. Thank uh, you. Yeah, no, absolutely, Lindy. Thank you. Uh, well done. Yeah, bye, Robert. Yes, thank you. I think we're all live. There's no way to turn off that I can okay, find. Okay, so we did. We just leave then, I guess. <laughs> I uh, think we do leave. Yes. Thank you all. Okay. Be well. Bye. Have a great uh, rest of your day. Yes. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye.